Amen. So we are in a season of fasting, and uh, I challenged a group last week that came uh, at 9 o'clock before church. Um, I handed out a, a piece of paper that talked about fasting, different types of fast, and everybody starts to think like, oh, no, I can't give up anything. I'm dependent on food. Pastor, what are you asking? Listen, fasting is, a, is I believe, a principle that we need and a discipline in the church even more than ever right now in the history of our world and where we're living and just a lot happening that we, we just need to quiet ourselves and set some time aside with the Lord and, uh, and really just seek God. How many of you know there, again, I've said this before, but there's a lot of distractions out there. We have a lot of distractions. There are so many distractions. We need to quiet those by what? Denying our flesh, denying ourselves inclining our ear to what the Spirit of God is speaking a little bit more clearly. And God does it. Listen, He does it. For some of you that, that depend strictly on Sunday morning to keep you going through the rest of the week, I'm gonna, I'll just be honest, like you're going to be disappointed. How many of you go to um, do your refrigerator once a week? How, how many of you go... You know, I mean, really, if you're, if you're on the road and you travel and you do say, how many of you go to one restaurant and say, oh, I'm an, it's enough for me. I'm ready. This is the best meal I've ever had. I'm ready to conquer the week. Come on, it doesn't make any practical sense in our brains, right? It doesn't make sense. So why do we do that spiritually? And even when you deny yourself food physically, that is one great way to eat spiritually telling you there's something about it when you begin to deny yourself my wife and I we talk about different things during the fast and I'm like Elisa you know our brain our minds tell us so many things that aren't true and one of them is is if you skip a meal I'm gonna starve I'm gonna I'm starving <laughs> I'm gonna die like you know, you're not gonna die I told my wife it's more like you know your brain is telling you, you need to eat and it's like yeah I do need to eat which is that's our our, our physical brain sending out chemicals and sending out messages to our body from our stomach. There's a little relay that's going on, right? And, and, and the right thing to do would be to do what? To eat. But, but, when you live in God's kingdom, there's a different way to think and a different way to live, I'm telling you. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning, but I just want to throw this at, out at you. You're not ruled by your stomachs. You're not ruled by your minds either, okay, by your thought life. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm starving, I'm going to die. Like, no, you're not, you're not. Listen, if you don't eat and you don't drink any water in eight days, that's a different story. However, however, you can deprive yourself of those things that you love for a season. Why? get rid of distractions so you can incline your ear and open God open my eyes so I can see what you see what am I supposed to be doing here for some of you it's social media just give up seven days that's all I'm asking seven days of social media we're doing three weeks and I've broken it down to seven seven days okay three sorry yeah three weeks so if you can do one week that's seven days of something that you love just give it up when my girls were uh, listening to my wife and I, we're, we were going to call a fast for our family. They started chiming in. They were going to give up candy. They were going to give up cereal. They were gonna, and listen, for my Victoria to give up cereal, that's, that's a big thing. When she was little, she loved cereal, right? That was a big thing, but she gave it up. Why? She was wanting to be a part of the family, but she was wanting to, and we we're trying to teach her that she's not ruled by the desires of her flesh and her body. We could preach it, Nick, man. I mean, come on. All I'm saying is this again, seven days. If you could do seven days, some of you, you could do the three weeks, 21 days. We started on Saturday, yesterday, and we're going to push through to the end of the month, 31 days. There are flyers on the back window. When you walk outside there, go ahead and grab one. I've uh, stationed uh, each day uh, alongside a, a specific topic. This week it's vision, next week is uh, love, next week is, is faith. 
And so I'm, I'm just trying to give you something to shoot for, a goal to pray for, and just pray the scripture, pray something that God is dropping in your heart. And, and you're gonna learn this. When you start praying for yourself, God begins to put people in your mind and in your heart so that you could pray for them. So when you get them, like Elisa was saying, and that name comes across, their face comes across, what we do is when we see somebody that reminds us of somebody that we know, we pray for the person that we don't know, and we pray for the person that we do know. And how many of you know when you go to the mall, you're like, hey, that looks like so-and-so. Pray for that person because they got your attention and pray for the person that looks like them. I'm telling you, that's one way that God draws us in. And, and you're going to find something. There's a joy in it. It's not a, a labor. Listen, fasting is a challenge, but you're going to find that when you set your mind to do it, when you set your mind on it, there's a joy that comes from that. You begin to feel fulfilled. Joy comes to you. And it's a way. There's a way. There's a way, I'm telling you, that is not... It's not our way, but it's God's way. And when we start to think that way, listen, everything that you thought mattered, it takes us a back seat. It does. It really does. So I challenge you, church, step into the 21 days of fasting with us. I'm only asking from one week from you, teaching you how to fast. Just seven days. Give something up that you love. All right, so the message is clear. I think I said it six times. Okay. <laughs> There's a way. So get this. Uh, the thing that also Elisa was mentioning, we believe that we want, we want to make an impact on our city. And one of the ways that we are going to do it is prayer. And what we began to do is network with our uh, ministry network here at Selma. Um, and I, I have five names already given to me, but there are several more. I have five names that uh, we have five police officers that work um, as police officers or part of staff at, in Selma. And um, I have five names to give out. And what, what we're going to do is we're going to do it this way. If you pick up, pick up the, uh, the page on the back table, if you feel, don't, don't pick it. Listen, I'm telling you, pastor thinks very practically. If, you, if you're too busy and you pick up a, a, a name and then you, you're given a name and then you just get too busy through the year and then you fall off, that's not what I'm asking. Like, like don't even do it. Like, save yourself just the, the agony of like, I'm, I'm failing, I'm failing at it. Don't, don't even pick one up. But what I'm asking is, if God is touching your heart, pick one of those papers up and tell me, Pastor, I really want to adopt a cop. Doesn't that sound cool? You want, I want to adopt a cop, and I want to pray for it. That way I can send your name to uh, the coordinator, and then we can have you and her uh, coordinate a name, and they will give you a name to pray for. But I need to know, okay? I'm, I'm, you come and talk to me. Pastor, that's me. I want one. We have about, there was about 50 names that we had, and so I have five, and we're going to do something um, special with those five. So if we have more, there's more people. All right, are we clear? Okay, awesome. Did I forget anything else? One more time. Oh yes, thank you, babe. Uh, my wife is giving me some fasting tips up here. Water, drink a lot of water. If you do give up food, get, get water. But one of the things, if you just wanna go straight to liquids, um, I've learned that I can only do 10 days. Pastor only does 10 days, but I do something a little different where I kind of incorporate a cleanse in it. And so I've learned that lemon water is a good detoxer, okay? But how many of you know that it's not so kind on your stomach sometimes, makes you sour? So through the research that I've done over the last, what, 20 years, um, and, and maybe even over the last 15 years that I've been doing this, Lemon water with organic maple syrup as a little sweetener in there will give you enough calories that you can go 10 days with no problem. I'm not, I'm not kidding. You would do 10 days. Now, here's the, here's the challenge. Some of you that are like this thin, like this thin, you got to be careful because you, you, you don't have a lot of unnecessary fat to lose on your body. So you got to be careful because your muscles will start to atrophy a little bit. Your body needs calories, so it's stealing calories from your muscle. Okay, so when you take the maple syrup, you're getting a little bit of calorie and your, your body kind of does a little of adjustment, right? So it's not robbing your muscle and atrophying your muscle um, as quickly. So it, there's a biology lesson, physiology lesson. So get this, two tea, tablespoons, two tablespoons of lemon juice, 
two tablespoons of maple syrup, and we figured 16 ounces of water makes a nice glass of lemonade. We, it calls for about 10 ounces of water, but again, we're trying to hydrate, so we do 16 ounces, two, two, and 16 ounces, all right? If you drink that for 10 days, you'll be looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> next week, ripped. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> I'm telling you, don't do it unless the Lord's telling you to do it, but it'll work. Amen. Let's have our kids stand and let's dismiss them to their time in the Lord. Amen. Stretch out your hands. Let's pray for our kids. Lord, bless them. Keep them. Cause your face to shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lord, lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace in Jesus' name. That's a blessing. Amen. Be blessed. We're packing it out. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. In Bible school, they taught us, don't begin preaching until you hear the pages of your Bible you know, stop turning. Like, don't begin your sermon until you <laughs> you begin to hear the pages. Well, I don't hear pages turning much anymore because it's a, a lot of people have digital digital Bibles, so it's really it's like okay, I just got to make an adjustment here. So, if I ask the question this morning, how many of you can honestly say? Don't raise your hands. I'm just going to ask this. Just asking a question. 2020 is off to a great start this year. It's the best beginning of the year that I've ever had in my entire life. 20, there was something about 2020. This is a great year. Now, some of us can honestly raise your hands and say, yes, absolutely, it has been. But some of us are like, I don't know. It's another year. It's just another celebration, another time. For us to, you know, just, just keep living life, Pastor. It, it hasn't changed for me. But one of the things I wanted to do this year and beginning of the year is to choose a, a couple of sermons that we would be inspired by, and that God would use to really get us on track moving forward into what he has for us individually, as a family, and corporately together as a church. And one of the things I was focused on is there's some main things, main things. There's some important things. There are some, some special things that, that I think that we could focus on that can really set our course for the entire year. How many of you know that a year can make a difference in the history of your life? And we can, we can come down just to a day. But, but you know this, one year can be such a pivotal year for you that it could alter your course of history. Just, just think about that. The choices and the decisions that you make can alter your course of history. But not only for you, for those around you and for those that follow you. So my, my passion in me is to help people find God find Jesus, walk with the Holy Spirit, knowing that your decision to live for Christ is the most important thing, the most important thing that you could ever do in your life. So we talked last week, week about first things first and encountering Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus and sitting in his presence and, and learning, learning to encounter him and engage him and listen to what he's speaking and learning of him and loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. But I want to say that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. And I, as, I, as I started the research, you know, what God, what is it that I could uh, impart? What is it that I can give from, from my life and how I've learned and how we've lived as a, as a family and how I've experienced church life. 
and what church life has meant to me and, and how, how coming to be a part of a community of faith has, has changed the course of my history in life. And there were, it was very clear, it was very clear, the things that God has been speaking to me lately is that it's one thing to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead and that I'm declared saved. Somebody, you understand that? You're saved. That if you believe, okay, and you confess, you're saved. But that's just the beginning. And if you have had conversation with me throughout the years, you will have heard this somehow in conversation. Maybe I've even said it up here, but what's the missing link in America? What's the missing link, link for the nations of the world? What's that missing link that really sets us apart and makes us different from the rest of the churches in this community? from the rest of the families in this community, from the rest of the individuals in this community. What is that missing link? And, and I want to propose to you this morning, I want to give this in a way to challenge you, but I, I want to I say this. You believe that Jesus came and died on Calvary's cross for your sin. You believe it, okay? And you have confessed that with your mouth. But I want to challenge you with the next step. Is Jesus Christ your king is Jesus Christ your king the next step I believe for this church is to realize that salvation is not enough for me to live in God's kingdom I, I want to be careful of what I'm saying because salvation is enough you understand but but why is it that I get the calls I get the letters I get the emails I get calls even from my, uh, my former network in Texas from people saying, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. And they've been Christians for almost their entire life. I'm telling you guys, when you step into a call and each one of us, I believe, have something to do in God's kingdom, God will give you different eyes to see people. There are times when you have a lot of grace for people, new converts, new Christians, baby Christians, a lot of grace. We need a lot of grace. There are times when you need to speak God's mercy over their life. Even some people who have been Christians for a long time that have walked and fought the good fight of faith and then they fall or something happens in their, their life and maybe they start blaming God and pointing the finger at God. But there was, there's just something that God, again, fills your heart with compassion for people, to, for God to pour out his mercy. God, don't, don't punish them. God, love them. Love them, God. Love them back into your kingdom. So grace and mercy and, and, and love. But, but I'm going to tell you this, that, that sometimes that we don't see, we don't see, we don't see, okay, the fullness of God and his kingdom at work. Okay. I'm trying to go slow so that we, I'm pulling you along. We don't see God working the way he works because our minds are clouded with carnality. Our minds, our, our hearts are hard. Our lives are filled with sin. You know, and so I'm thinking again, what's the missing link? Lord, what's the missing link? And, and it's this, it's that God's kingdom is different. But my church doesn't realize it. See, God's kingdom is different than the world's pattern. We, we are a, a, we're in a foreign land. We're, we're carved out. We're made different when you come to believe and you receive Jesus in your life. Okay, so get this. Why do we keep struggling? Why do we keep falling? Why do we keep going back? Because we have not yet learned what God's kingdom is. We've not quite understood it. We've not quite had the understanding of really and, and how to interpret it, <clears throat> how, to, how to 
see it for what it really is. And I believe this, that that could be the missing link. That could be the missing link for you, for your family, for generations to come. That if you begin to believe that you see, okay, that you're not living in the pattern of this world to make you successful, to make you rich, to make you influential, that's not what your life has been carved out to be in God's kingdom. I just read about a missionary to China. Years and years, he pastored thousands of people indirectly through house churches in China. Brother Yoon is his name. And Brother Yoon is a different cookie in the batch. And he says, America's a great country. America's great. You guys, you guys have, a, you have, it, you have it made over there. See, we don't know God like Brother Yoon knows God in a way that now I can see his life as a testimony. And, and again, be, I'm trying to be careful with the words I choose because I believe that by faith God comes and provides for all our needs. This is a blessed nation. What you see, the houses that you live in, you have cars to drive. Listen, you're better off than the majority of the world. You think you're poor? You're not poor. Come with me to India. You're not poor. We'll go through the garbage slums. See all the kids picking up garbage and eating it. You're, you're, you're not poor. So here, here's the thing. Brother Yoon says this. I believe the American church has missed something. That they have traded, traded, okay, the real gospel for a false gospel. That hurts and what, what he's saying is that it's, we, we, have, we have given people the reason, okay? There, there, here's this reason and this reason and this reason on why you need to live this way as a Christian in America, okay? And I think what has happened through the history of the church in the last 30 years or so, especially among our community of believers, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics, That we begin to see God, that he's our daddy out there, and that daddy, papa God, and I'm, not, I'm just, just follow me, okay? That he's going to give you everything that you ever desire in your entire life, and you're going to get it all when you come to him. We need to be really careful, church, in this generation. And I'm, I, listen, I, I get all sweaty up here. I don't know if you can notice, because this message is hard, a hard word for pastors. And this is why. Because, listen, I believe that God has blessed us, but not primarily first to hoard the blessing. <laughs> to primarily bless you because he trusts you. Because your heart is open to him. And so then you live with hands wide open, and money comes and flows through your hands to be a blessing. Business ideas come. Job opportunities come. Raises come. Things come your way. Why? He's blessing you to be a blessing. That's God's kingdom. But on the other hand, oh, it's all about you. Put it in your 401k. I'm not knocking that. Just hear my heart. Build wealth, build wealth, build wealth, build wealth for what? But Brother Yoon shook me up. He says, I know Christ in suffering. I know Christ in suffering. And he says, if I, and then and again, you got to understand what, what he was saying is he was under, like he couldn't have a church. And, and the church that they had, it had to be sanctioned by the state. But the underground church is larger than any sanctioned church in China. In fact, they're Right now, they're persecuting pastors. They're killing them. Uh, uh, a state pastor, one church who was sanctioned by the, the, the government, they closed down his church. They knocked it down. They took him and they killed him because he was, out of Christ's compassion, feeding homeless people. This just happened. This is our generation. But Brother Yoon was tortured because of the gospel. He was tortured, and he was... He was put in prison. 
But he's, his focus was God's kingdom first. God's kingdom first. God's kingdom is what it's all about. I'm here to build God's kingdom. And his focus was this, telling people about Jesus, living a life worthy to be, called, to be counted worthy by him to say, come on in, son, I know you. I know you by your name. And that's how he lived his life. But it shook me up to say, God, I don't know if I quite understand your kingdom the way Brother Yoon does. Because he is saying he knows you in suffering. And here I am sleeping in a comfortable bed every night, driving a nice car, have, you know, having a nice house. And, 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 and I'm not knocking that. I'm telling you, this is where you have to find balance. You have to find balance. But, but here's, the, here's the thing. If that's all I live for, is to have a bigger bank account, drive a nicer car, wear nice, I like shoes, okay? Okay, you have a nice pair of shoes. <laughs> Come on. Then I got it wrong. I have it all wrong. And I'm thinking this, if, if I can say, God, can you teach me, Lord, about your kingdom? Can, can you teach me what it really means, Lord, to, to be in this 2020 in the year and to, to know you, God, to know you, Lord? Not as the world tells me who God is, but as you in your kingdom, God, have, have made yourself known. I want to know you like the apostles of old, God. I want to know you like the missionaries that gave up everything to live their life for Christ. I, that's how I want to know you, Lord. And if it takes 21 days for me to fast and, 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 and suffer, then so let it be, God. It's nothing. It's nothing. My wife and I were talking about it. It's nothing even know what we're doing you know it's nothing living for God is everything you know generally speaking Americans don't like kings some of you even have a problem with our president right now you don't like kings you don't like the attitude of a king and I understand that one of the things I've been really just wrestling with is we are not of this world so why am I getting so worked up over politics I'm telling you, my brother and I, we talk about politics and we can get so worked up. And I just have to stop. I don't even listen to talk radio anymore right now. I'm just like, I turn it off. I get so frustrated. But there's that still small voice in me that says this. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. I forget, I forget how that says, but and it is Christ and, and what? He shall reign over all the earth. So it puts it in perspective for me this morning. Christ's kingdom is not the world's kingdom. The order of things is different. And I hope this shifts this year at the beginning of the year for us. Your focus in 2020 isn't to build your career to become more successful. It isn't to build your business to be number one, even though God will make you number one. You gotta hear my heart. Yeah. Your, your, your focus, your energy, what you spend your life on, what you give it with passion and commitment. Listen, if you can get this thing right at the beginning of the year, God will bless you, he will. I say that with conviction, man. Because I see and I believe this, the blessings will overtake you and they'll consume you. But we don't like kings. We got away from a king rule. The United States was born. Some of us think of kingdoms as a faraway land. Never, never lands. My wife likes to kind of stay up to date with the, the royal family and stuff. And she teaches, she's teaching me a little bit of what royalty is and, and how they act and how they conduct themselves and the things that they do. And I, and I want to say there's a lot of truth in that in God's kingdom. As far as being a loyal subject, a, a, someone who's submitted to authority. And I don't want to take that tangent just yet, but, but how many of you know that whenever we have a mindset of having a ruler of our life, some of us have a problem with that. Some of us don't like being told what to do by someone else. So I have my own business. 
I run, the, oh, I run my own show. I'm just talking this morning. I'm telling you, man, God's kingdom's different. And I think that whenever we realize in Matthew 6, whenever we read that last week, in fact, let me just turn back there and I'll read it to you again so you know it's not me, it's the Lord. <laughs> the Lord is speaking. Matthew 6, says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And I said this last week, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So are you there in Luke chapter one? Let's go there. I'm gonna read the New King James Version. In fact, I'm gonna start in verse 30. We're gonna read down to 33 and it says this. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Father, help us this morning to see you as king of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So this passage is speaking of Jesus being in the lineage of King David, appointed to the throne of God the Father to reign not over an earthly kingdom, but over an eternal kingdom. And that's just something right off the bat the disciples did not understand. And that's something that we in here still have trouble understanding because we want that deliverer in the White House. We want somebody to help us prosper. We want somebody Okay? to show us that there's a better way to live. We want to be imitators of people that are successful. And all that is, is good, but, but when, we, when it comes down to it, is Jesus king of your life? See, the Bible's full of references. There's, there's times when he says he's the king of the Jews, he's the king of Israel, blessed is, uh, he's the blessed and only sovereign, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. Um, I was going to read that, but it just says, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So however many thousands of years that was re written to the Ephesians, it's, it's still the same for us today. Here's the news, church. Here's the news, Flash America. We have a king, and his name is Jesus. We have a king, Jesus, name above all names. But he's not just a king. He's not an earthly king. He rules with all dominion and power and authority over all things. So I want to leave you with two things this morning as we look at some truths on how to keep Christ and his kingdom at the center of daily living. How to keep Christ at the center and his kingdom at the center of daily living. And the first one is this. Number one, here's the revelation. We are citizens of Selma. So we're citizens of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. I'm going to say it again. We are citizens of heaven. And there's a second point on this. I want to say that this world is not our home. So if we can get something straight this morning, let's get the main thing straight this morning. First, in our mentality, in our minds, in our hearts, we're citizens of heaven. The kingdom of this world is not our home. Politics. It's not our home. Money, that's not our home. Beauty, vanity, come on. Isn't it amazing how people these days try to turn back the clock of aging? And you can see them a mile away walking towards you at the mall. And they've changed things. 
change things. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> I mean, the, the fact is what? Is that we're all aging. And the one thing, one thing that in our realm here that will be dealt with when Jesus comes back is that there'll be some of us, maybe our kids or grandkids, they won't, they won't ever die. They won't ever die. Death has been dealt with. It's lost its sting, right? Death has been dealt with by Jesus. He resurrected, came back to life. But we, we all have a day here on earth. But the devil will try to trick you. He'll make you fearful. He, he'll, he'll give you doubt and anxiety of you breathing your last breath on this earth. For some of us that are mature and that are older in here, you know, I even consider it, I'll be 50 this year. You know, I, I'm serious. I'm thinking, man, I've lived half my life. My grandma, great-grandma on my dad's side lived to be 104. I've lived half my life. My grandfather's almost going to be 100. I think he's 97, going to be 98, something like that. Like, if, I mean, really, if I think about it, like I've lived half my life. One day I will stop breathing on this earth. Whether, again, it's before that or later, I don't know. But if you guys consider this and you consider, man, I don't want to die. I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid to, I'm afraid to stop breathing. So and I think that's our human reaction. We have a carnal mind. I think that's a human response. But do you know that it's going to be a beautiful thing when you pass from this life to the next? Glory. And when Paul the Apostle knew it, man, he's like, man, I'm struggling here. I'll do my life in Christ here. I'll suffer for him. But go ahead, take my life. There's a far better one waiting for me in heaven on the other side. I love Paul. He knew you can, you take my life. You just take it. I'm going to be with him. You just gave me a bonus. I'm telling you, will you pray for the citizens around us in Selma, wherever you live in your city? I was driving off the freeway yesterday and I saw a man unconscious laying on the side of the, the road. He was unconscious. And I don't know how, when it happened, I don't even know how it happened, but again, it can kind of formulate this, but he was, he was unconscious. I was like, hey, hey, wake up. He wasn't waking up, put my hazard lights on. I came outside and, and you know, you, I'm kind of approaching with like caution and, and tapping him, he's not moving. I'm thinking there's a trail of blood now going down the sidewalk. I'm like, I just stumbled across a murder. That's what I thought. I just stumbled across this guy. He was kind of losing color. And I'm praying, and I call 911, and I'm like, there's a guy. He's unconscious. He's not moving. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm praying. How many of you know you can pray while you're talking? You know, you, you can. So, so anyway, I'm in my mind, I'm praying, right? And then... And then I'm, I'm like looking at the guy and he's not doing anything. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I see him breathing now. I'm talking to the 911 operator, right? I'm like, okay, he, he's breathing. And so I'm tapping him, trying to wake him up. And then, and then all of a sudden, and I'm praying. And listen, I don't say it verbally on the phone, but I'm like, Lord, give this guy a second chance. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's going crazy all of a sudden. Will you just be bold to pray? I don't know if he was like dying, but he was he was not responding, but when I prayed, he woke up. He was drunk, but he woke up. <laughs> but why did I encounter the, the drunkard on laying on the street? You, you see what I mean? How many other cars passed him by? How many other cars were afraid to get out of their car? I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying do what the Lord tells you to do. So he did, he told me, and I got out, and I don't know, I'm praying for that man, the young man, pulled out a mosaic wetable bottle from his pocket, but hey, God, he's alive, I pray God uses one of our Spanish ministries in the community, Lord send him there. Christ's kingdom, Christ's kingdom. So I was saying that, pray for everybody that you encounter. Jesus did not usher in the same type of kingdom that David or Solomon ruled over. You gotta understand this. He didn't come to overthrow Roman rule by force. The disciples expected it, but he didn't do it. That wasn't his, his rule. That wasn't what he was setting up to do. But instead, he rules and reigns over the hearts and lives of his people. It's a different mindset. It's a different kingdom. In John 18, 20, uh, 33 through 38, I want to read this. 
because it really paints a picture. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? You guys remember the Passion of the Christ? I love how that's captured in that. I think it's a, it does, they do a really good job at that moment. And Jesus answered, listen to what Jesus says. This is the English Standard Version. I just pulled this out to make a little more sense. But this is the essence of what Jesus' answer was. Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? See, there's, there's something out of the mouth of Jesus that we need to capture right here. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, some of us have been raised in church, raised in church since I was four. I have to give answer to God myself. I discover who he is, my relationship with him. Not my parents. God did a transformative work in their life. God did a transformative work in my life. I have a relationship with him of my own accord. Now, a friend might have brought you to church. A family member might have brought you to church. But when the word of God encounters you and you're hearing something and your heart starts going, boom, 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 boom. And it's like starting to sit inside you like, oh, man, that really is convicting me. What he's saying, I, I thought that about God. And, man, I, now I'm learning. Wait, God loves me. He cares for me. He pours his grace and his mercy and his love out for me, to me. Of your own accord not somebody else's not somebody else's words of who they say he is but your words see what what I was challenged with when I read the story of brother Yoon in, in China was that's how he encountered God that's how he experienced God he knew God in suffering that was his calling for me I live in the United States of America I live in a place where our forefathers have orchestrated a blessing to follow all the citizens of the United States of America. Now listen, if you are knocking the government every day right now on social media to every conversation, be warned. Be warned. I, I, as a pastor, spiritual leader, listen, I'm just warning you. And I try, I, I so bad want to comment on a lot of stuff, but I try not to. I'll only throw out things that kind of maybe I feel impact my life. But, but just, just, just know this, just be careful. We influence people, we influence others. Can you imagine if you were wrong? That's all I'm saying. Can you imagine if, if you led somebody to believe something that wasn't true about somebody else? Can you imagine? You're guilty. Can you imagine? Listen, I, I can go on. Bill, I don't know really what's in Bill's heart and his conviction. If Bill has said Jesus is Lord from his, his mouth, I'm going to believe him. But then you say, well, he doesn't act like it outside of church, Pastor. <laughs> Bill, I love you. You know that. And I know we have... But you know what I'm saying, right? I would be very careful to go around and telling people about Bill, how he lives outside of these four walls. How many of you know? Come on, I'm not. This is not Bill's life, but I'm just saying. How many of you know? I don't know what happened in Bill's life when he was younger. I don't know why he has chosen to do certain things and act out a certain way. I don't know. I'm not his judge. But I love him into what? It, with compassion into Christ's kingdom. Show him the way. Lead him in the way of truth and righteousness for him to discover who God is. It's not my... Huh. I'm not going to back talk this guy. I'm not going to talk bad, stab him in the back with my words. You, you see what I mean? Every time I say that he's not something, uh, 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 uh. We're doing it now to our president. You did it to Obama. Now you're doing it to Trump. Come on. They're men. This is not God's kingdom. This is the place we live, and we're blessed. I didn't mean for it to be political, Lord. You knew that. 
I didn't mean for it to be. But do you say, do you say this of your own accord, or do others say it about you? What are you saying about him? Who are you saying he is to you? Where are you right now walking in your life? And I want to pose this question. How can you better serve your king? How can you better serve your king? Number one, you're understanding that this is Christ's kingdom and we're citizens of heaven and this world is not our home. So let's forget about all that political junk and let's get our eyes on Jesus and say, God, what are you doing? Why are you pressing me through the world system? I'm feeling the pressure. I'm paying buku taxes out of my pocket. That hurts me, Lord, you know. But God, I, I, I'm just seeing God. All that aside, all that aside, why have you put me in this nation? Why have you allowed me to live in the freedom of religion? Come on, that'll preach. I have the expression to worship you any way that I want. If you go to India with me, they're like, oh, this is some, these made some nice sounds. Oh, oh, they start worshiping the drums. I walk through the streets of, of of, uh, of uh, Secunderabad, India, and I'm walking down the street and I see all these flowers. Uh, these machines are adorned with flowers and there's like candles burning. I'm like, Stanley, what? What, what is this? It looks like an altar. He goes, yeah, they're worshiping that machine. I go, what? He goes, yeah, that machine. They're worshiping that machine because it brings them food to eat. You, you hear what we're saying? It, they turned their the, the, the garments, whatever it was <coughs> making, it brought them money. They went to buy food. They were giving blessings to the machine. I'm like, that's so warped. You know, I mean, I mean, come on. There's, there's just a, a, one God. There's one Lord. There's one King. His name is Jesus. That's it. I'm telling you, he didn't usher in a kingdom, a pattern, a political pattern. We're citizens of heaven. I like what Paul says. Brother in Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with ears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is the, in their uh, glory, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject, to, to subject all things to himself. We have a king. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, and because our citizenship is in heaven, we are pilgrims in a foreign land. I'm telling you, I think this, why, what's the missing link? Why is it, why is it that I just feel like I, I don't fit in? I don't fit in. I don't fit in. Do you know that's how I lived my life in school? I didn't fit in. For some of you, it might be a shock. My daughters asked me, Dad, were you popular in high school? And I said, I think a little bit. I played sports, you know. And uh, that just seemed to be people were popular that played sports, you know. And I mean, there'll be people like I'll be at the store even now. They're like, hey, what's up, Quintana? And looking around like I don't remember them. But they remember me. And my daughters will say, Dad, who was that? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. But it's, it's a funny thing to, to them because they're like, oh, Dad, who? I, it's just funny. Anyway, <laughs> why was I saying that? Um, yeah, my brother. Oh, my brother, he's a comedian, man. Tell a little quick story. I cleaned out our trophy shop, my trophy case at my parents' house last weekend. And so we delivered the, the medals and trophies to my brother. And, and, I, and, I, and I told his son, I said, hey, Cody, listen. I go, don't let him tell you a story. I go, half of those medals in that box, they're mine. I go, Cody, the only reason why I'm giving them to my brother is because I don't even remember the events. Honest, we, we had, it's a box, a box full of medals. And he looked at me and he says, yeah, Cody, all of mine are first place and his are third place. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that's my brother for you. <laughs> what was I talking about, babe? Bring me back. <laughs> she doesn't even know. Let me go back to the scripture. <laughs> we have a king, but we are in a foreign land. Huh? We don't fit in. I don't fit in. I didn't fit in in high school. My girls will tell me, Dad, I just don't feel like I fit in. I don't feel like I fit in. Listen, for as long as we are here on earth and we make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and King, we will feel like we don't fit in. You will feel like it. Your friends invite you to the party. Well, they used to. They used to. You don't get the call anymore. Nobody calls me anymore. Why? They know you've chosen a different kingdom. And it is okay. They know that you have, what, you, you have set yourself aside to worship God, to live for Him. You're different now. And with you in their life, they feel convicted, they feel guilty, they feel shameful. And what do you do? Just invite me over, bro. All I want to do is watch the game with you, man, that's all. I'm not going to drink your brews, oh, that's it, you drink them, that's not for me anymore. But, but listen, you hear what I'm saying, you will not fit in, you won't feel like fitting. Can I say this? Let me, let me help you. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. God will send you a family, a, a people group, a community of faith that you can link arm in arm with, and you can stand proclaiming the truth that you both know. Jesus Christ is king. And that is a truth. I'm telling you, that is a truth. That's a missing link even in the church do you know the pattern of fellowship, the pattern of how we do church? I'm, I'm just very, I'm just very, very like, oh man, you gotta be careful, guys. Let us show you the pattern and how to make church attractive to non-Christians. Like, I, I'm hearing that lingo from my, my colleagues, my buddies. Like, we, may, we need to make the church appetizing for the non-Christian. That's what they're telling me. We need to make the church appetizing. We need to make it, you know, where they feel comfortable. So they go and play secular music in the lobby. We, we know these people. This is not the kingdom of the world. God has a standard, a set standard. It's called righteousness. It's called holiness. It's called living purely before him. And I'm telling you, this is the difference. This is where the rubber meets the road now. Let me moonwalk back to the text. So remember the point. The world is not your home. Say that with me. The world is not my home. The way the world thinks, what the world does, that is not you anymore, 2020. It's not you anymore. Depression, it's not me anymore. Addiction, that's not me anymore. Come on, sickness, that's not me anymore. We can go on and on. But if we lose sight of the reality of where our home is, we will fall subject to the way of the world. You will be pressured to go along with your friends, your family members, those people who tell you, man, that life that you chose to live, you don't have any fun anymore. You're no fun anymore. Do you know that I have more joy in my life today because I'm living this way? That's your answer. <laughs> Here's the trouble, here's the trouble. After we've made ourselves comfortable living the way that the world lives, it's really hard, it's really hard to get out of that comfort zone and to pursue the things of God. That's just the warning this morning to us going into 2020 even further. So much so, so much so that we avoid being uncomfortable. So much so that the discomfort, that when we feel the prodding of our hearts and the Holy Spirit telling us to go a certain way, we don't want to go that way. 
We, we, we just feel like I'm comfortable now and I'm happy now where I'm at. And so God, you stay over there. 2020, oh, I'm gonna be comfortable again in 2020. So when this happens, we often cease to live as those loyal subjects to our king. So the missing link is this, is what, what do we do? So, so let me just tell you what we don't do. We don't take great steps of faith because we begin to fear. And I've been talking to a few people. I'm not, I'm not preaching to you guys that you know that you've talked to me. This was just something that I, I came to what I believe the Holy Spirit was speaking. See, we don't take great steps of faith because we fear risk. We fear risk. And so we never see how God can provide far beyond what we could ever think or imagine. And fear seizes you and he keeps you in that nice little comfort zone. See, we only have heart, half-hearted fight in us that when sin is knocking at our door, come on, come on, Cain, sin's knocking at your door, you must learn to master it, Cain. You must learn to master it, not you and your strength, but because of his strength, his righteousness. But uh, some of us, we only have half-hearted fight against sin. When temptation comes knocking on the door, it requires a lot of effort to tell it to go away. And we don't want to have that fight. So we give in and we yield. But in God's kingdom, greater is he that's in you. Come on. He's reminding you, I've already won the victory, son, daughter. I've won that. That temptation, it will not lay hold of you. Ooh, that's the fire in me. Temptation is not a sin. The devil is going to wage war against your mind with temp, temp, temptful thoughts, uh, temp, whatever, temptation. He's going he's gonna to bombard you. He's going to come against you. Your weakest point, he's going to keep stabbing you right there. Mm. Fast, I'm telling you. Get uncomfortable for 21 days. Make yourself ready for the rest of the year. Why? Because you have an enemy that doesn't want you to succeed in knowing that it's his kingdom alive and well in you, in you, in your heart. It's in us. Do you know that you not resisting temptation will stunt your spiritual growth in 2020? Do you know that God's best for you is to grow spiritually in 2020, but when you yield to temptation, it will stunt your spiritual growth. That's a warning. We don't stand for truth because we can't stand being labeled as narrow-minded Christians. Or you're a bigot, you are intolerant, and you're on the wrong side of the war, buddy. See, we use up the resources that God has given to us by saying this, bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. And we bless ourselves as Christians. Bless this church, Lord. Let us encounter your presence, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. I'm careful to say this, but that's a generation in the Pentecostal movement where we're like, we just need more of him to be blessed. And then we just grow fat and obese. God, forgive me, but you know what I'm saying? This is a, a motivational message to say, let's get out of the old world order of thinking and let's get over it to the kingdom thinking. He's given us resources so that we could bless not only ourselves, but bless other people. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. 
See, when we live with the world as our home, we begin to treasure the comfort of what the world says you need. We begin to put our focus on the temporary pleasures of what those things offer us and what they bring us. Again, what it does is what? It renders me powerless. You understand my passion? I'm speaking, I'm preaching to myself. If you desire the things of the world, you will become powerless. That's the enemy saying, I won. I got them to believe a lie that they don't have authority in Jesus. They don't have power to overcome. I have got them to to be distracted and thinking that they need to become rich and famous and start a YouTube channel. I just thought I'd throw in there, I don't know, younger generation. You hear hear what I'm saying? I want to be noticed, me. I need to be noticed. I'm fighting the celebrity thing up here. I don't want that. I want to be real and practical and saying, God, use me in your kingdom in a powerful and mighty way. So then he says what? Give it up, son. Give it up. And I'm like, ah, why did I say that? He's going to have to fast for 21 days. He's going to have to seek the Lord. He's going to have to pray. Oh, man. I guess the second thing, let's go there because I'm running out of time, man. Jesus, help me. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. And what that means is we're first his messengers and then we're his representatives. And I I want you to know something and I'm just gonna go pretty crazy here in a second because this is really what makes a difference for me. When I say Jesus is my king. I be honest with myself and ask myself this question and I say this is there somebody in your life that you try to model your life after I mean, think about it is there somebody who's made an impact in your life and you try to model your life like them I have a lot of friends pastor friends mentors in my life I love what they do my pastor fasted he, I learned how to fast from him he was, he was hardcore, man. He was, whew, he was a prayer warrior. I wish I could step into that realm. I'm learning how to. But I think what happens is we try to pattern ourselves after somebody else. But will you do something with me? Will you really take on the challenge this morning to learn to pattern yourself after Jesus? after Christ. Well, will you say, okay, Paul, I get what you were saying. We will be imitators as you were imitating Christ. We will follow you. You're a great example to follow. Paul, I'm learning a lot of things from you on how to do it. But all Paul's doing is saying, look, you have a connection too. You have a connection with him. Will you be an imitator of Jesus? Will you be his ambassador? Will you be his messenger? Will you represent him? Don't represent me. Don't represent New Hope Family Church. Represent Jesus and his kingdom. You're a citizen there first. But also don't make us look bad in the community. I mean, I'm just saying as a pastor, I'm just saying that's, I'm gonna be honest. Ambassadors for Jesus. This guy by the name of Charles Hodge, he says this. An ambassador is at once a messenger and a representative. He does not speak in his own name. He does not speak on his own authority. What he communicates is not his opinions or demands, but simply what he has been told or commissioned to say. Ooh, Mr. Hodge, you got it right, buddy. His message derives no part of its importance of trustworthiness from him. At the same time, he is more than a mere messenger. He represents his sovereign. He speaks with authority as credited in the name of his master. I love that. That's us as subjects to Christ. He is our king. He is our Lord. We are his loyal servants. And guess what? He has given us his name to represent. But I don't think I can do it. He has given you his name 
to be an ambassador and a messenger and a representative of his power and his authority. Not your own. Come on, you, you're getting it. Not your own, his. So what does it look like, pastor, in my everyday living? Love him, Jesus. Love him, Jesus. Help him, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> That's what it looks like. You carry yourself in a way telling you this is a powerful message it's a powerful message you carry yourself in a way that sh that brings honor to God brings honor to him and when you do when you do lives will be changed around you see ambassadors have all the authority to go and to make decisions from their authority when Jesus breathed on his disciples all authority has been given to you all authority has been given to you. All authority has been given to you. You are his representatives here now. Here now. Not tomorrow, but today. When you go home and you want to fight with your loved one, don't fight them. Come on. Just bow down. Kill your pride. Get rid of the, 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 the fight to overcome them. Come on. That's what it looks like every day. You pick up your cross and you follow him. You pick up your cross and he says, deny your flesh, right? Deny your flesh, deny yourself. Pick up your cross, your cross. It's your cross. He's carried his cross. It's now time to carry your cross. Your cross is different. Your temptation is different. He was tempted, so will you be. What did he fight with? The word, so will you. He overcame and stomped on the devil's head, and so have you. Come on. God has given you all power and authority in Christ Jesus. Not you, but in him. Devil, take your hands off my kids. My kids are my kids. They've been given, I've been given responsibility to help them live a life worthy of, of Jesus' kingdom. Take your hands off of them. I'm warning you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Is Lord Jesus is King Jesus there's no other name but that name will you stand this morning no other name father this morning we believe that we're citizens of heaven that we are citizens of in Christ's heavenly kingdom and that we're living to tell others that you are Lord and you are King. But Lord, it plays out this way in a very practical way. That Lord, in order for, for us to show them who you really are, then we need to believe that message for ourselves. On our own accord this morning, we make you Lord of our lives. Come on, all over this place right now, if you have been living on your own and you carried your old self into 2020 right now we lay that down Jesus I lay down my pride and my arrogance I lay down my willingness to win and succeed no matter what the cost at the cost of others and father this morning I say be my Lord be my Savior wash me in your blood forgive me of all my sins wipe away my past and I turn my back on 2019 and the days of old. And I look forward to being a new creation in Christ in 2020. Open up the doors that no man can open. I can't open up the doors, Lord. Only you can. And open up those doors and help me to see where you are and what you're doing. And give me the boldness and the courage to step into it for the rest of this year in Jesus' name. And with every head bowed and every eye closed now, listen, some of you have already started to pray that prayer, and I just want to leave you with this. It's a quote that I found by a missionary. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, 
then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And I ask you the question, how can you better serve your king? How can you better serve God in 2020? What do you need to leave behind? And what do you need to pick up in order to step into this new year? So again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, Pastor, I've never given my life to the Lord. I wanna make that declaration out of my mouth this morning. I wanna make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. Will you raise your hand if that's anybody in here? Amen, amen, you can put your hands down. Praise God. Amen, amen. So God's challenging us, church. There's a missing link of us living as his loyal subjects. And when we do, and he makes himself real to us, joy comes. Listen, joy comes. Joy fills our hearts. This new life, abundant life, it turns us and motivates us to do good towards others, to love God even more, but to do good towards others, to love our loved ones next to us, those that are distant from us. We bring them closer this year, 2020. And we say, God, change my heart so that I can show them who you are. Listen, if you raise your hand, if you might want to make a rededication to the Lord, just say this simple prayer. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of all my sins. Wipe away my past. Turn my life around. Give me a new heart and a new start. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, church. Listen, you have so much in you that God wants to unleash in 2020. Find that missing link in your life at the beginning of the year. And whatever main things the Lord is telling you to do, put those in order for your life. And when you do, I'm telling you, God will make it up, make the difference up in your life. Some of you are believing God for better jobs, better, better places to, to live, better cars, you know, uh, whatever it is. Listen, those are things that God will give you. I know that. He's not asking you to suffer in poverty. Listen, that's, we'll, we'll have another talk another day. God will give you what you give him, right? He will. He'll provide for you. I, un I understand that principle. Amen. Let's pray. Father, bless them. Keep them. Cause your face to shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lord, lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Jesus Christ is my king. Amen. God bless you.